start by thanking the organizers of this workshop and the programming for giving me the chance to be in here and being part of this. Um, I will be speaking about asymptotically evaluating linear correlation of multi-system functions. More precisely, I want to consider the question of whether there is a gene phenotype theorem for multi-physical functions. And to describe the setup of this question, let's pick a finite number of linear forms, phi1 up to phi r. These are supposed to be forms in f variables, so l is at least two. They should have integer coefficients. And together with these forms, we pick r constants, phi1 up to lr, and r arithmetic functions. And then we consider the linear correlation that arises by evaluating these forms, th these, these functions, these arithmetic functions, x1 up to hr, as the respective forms shifted by the respective functions. And we sum these products over lattice points in some region, in an expanding region t times k, where t is a parameter that we will let tend to infinity, and k is some nice subset of r to the s. Let's say it is a convex subset of the cube minus 1 up to 1 to the s. So that is the basic setup. And the question I want to consider is the following. Can we evaluate this correlation in some generality for multiplicative functions? That is for functions that I define on the natural numbers with values in R or C, and that preserve multiplication on pairs of co-prime integers. What I will present is a partial answer to this question. I will not be able to prove asymptotics for these correlations for multiplicative functions and for generality, but we will be able to do so for functions that belong to a certain class of functions. And the class is what I will describe next. So let's consider the set of multiplicative functions which satisfy four conditions. The first condition is that for each of these multiplicative functions, there should be a constant h, that is at least one, such that the functions are uniformly bounded along prime powers in this way. The second condition says that these functions have a divisor function like growth behavior. So there is a bound like, uh, like the divisor function satisfies. The third condition says that if you consider the sequence of prime of values these functions takes at primes, then th this sequence should have some density. And then finally, there is a more complicated condition that says that the functions in our class should have stable mean values and arithmetic progressions. So let's look at this a little bit more carefully. In he here on the left-hand side, we are computing the mean value of the function h up to x in an arithmetic progression a mod q. And now we allow this cutoff parameter x to vary a little bit. We can go down by a factor of a constant power of logarithm. And we request that the mean value stays essentially the same with an error term that is actually quite weak. To see how weak this error term is, let's insert into the, the expression on the left-hand side absolute values. And then under the conditions of this fourth, uh, of this fourth condition, Xi's result says that the left-hand side is actually bounded above by an expression that is of the shape as, it, as is in the bracket in the little o. So I wrote this up just in the setting we are in here at the moment. So this was the expression on the left-hand side with absolute value signs included. And then Shio's result will give you an expression 
that is very closely related to what we have inside our little O in the last condition. So going back to these four conditions, the first three conditions should for applications be fairly easy to check. The last condition might be more difficult to establish. And for that reason, I want to discuss that and I want to rephrase this last condition so that it might become easier to, to establish. In order to do so, we will use a result of Grenville and Sandra Rajan on mean values of, uh, on multiplicative functions and arithmetic progressions. And what does this result say? It says that if we let C be a fixed positive constant, and if we let H be a multiplicative function that is bounded, may well take values in the complex numbers. And if we consider for any X, the set of primitive con characters of conductor that runs up to at most log X to the C, and enumerate these characters in such a way that there are correlations with H form an absolute value, a sequence that is non-increasing, then we can do the following. Let's turn to, the, to this mean value in arithmetic progressions. And here we have an, a mean value in a progression congruent A mod Q, where Q is bounded by log X to the C, which is the same as we had before. Now you can, can rephrase this congruence condition as a character sum. But if you let Q be as large as log X to the C, then it might be difficult to deal with this character sum directly. And what this result allows you to do is to truncate this character sum and only look at the first K elements of it, where those first K characters are those induced from characters out of our sequence, maybe they are less. And by truncating our character sum in such a way, we incur an error term of the form essentially log x to the minus 1 plus 1 over square root of k. This is the result we would like to apply in order to rewrite the stability condition that the functions in our class M has, have to satisfy. In order to do so, we have to ensure that the error term that appears in this result is maybe included in our error term in, in this fourth condition. So we need to show that the error term from the previous slide is, can be included into this error term. Now in here we already have this 1 over log x. I'm just going back once. So the minus 1 is taken care of. And we now have to show that this, we have to be able to choose k sufficiently large so that 1 over square root of k is small enough for this factor log x to the 1 over square root of k to be bounded, to, to be a lower bound for this product over primes. However, there's some more information we can use. In condition three here, we assume that the sequence of H evaluated along primes has some density. And this lower bound can be used to obtain a lower bound on that product of primes. Here it's maybe important to note that Q is fairly small. So using this lower bound, we can find a lower bound on the product of primes, which comes with a, with a constant exponent alpha h for the logarithm, so that if we take our k, if we allow sufficiently many characters in, in the expansion with respect to this constant alpha h, our error term Will, the error term will be possible to, in, we will be possible to include the new error term into the one in the condition. 
So just from looking at the error term, this seems to be fine. But one thing we have to take care of is in here, we are looking at bounded multiplicative functions. But the functions in our class are not necessarily bounded. So there is a small detour that we have to make in order to apply this result. We may split our function into essentially a Dirichlet convolution of finitely many bounded functions. They're not all bounded, but there will be H bounded copies and one that has a sparse support. And to obtain those bounded copies in here, we may define another multiplicative function by setting it to equal at prime powers, that is to equal at primes, H of P divided by capital H. Here one has to recall that for H to be a member of this class, the values at primes are bounded above an, an absolute value by H. So this quantity here is bounded above by one so that this multiplicative function will be a bounded multiplicative function. And g prime will be zero at all prime values. And then one might apply the result of Grangorn Sandor down to one of these factors g and still apply the result. So using this result, one can reduce the condition that the function has stable mean values and arithmetic progressions to studying these correlations of the function H with characters of conductor bounded by log X to the C. So that might be easier. And in particular, if we look back at this statement, if we want to show that this quantity here has a stable mean value if we let this capital X vary a bit. In this result, we, can, we are allowed to vary it by quite a bit more than we actually need. But in order to show that this, uh, this expression here is stable, it would suffice to show that each of these correlations here are stable. And we moreover have to only take into account those characters for which the absolute value of this, cor this correlation, the absolute value of this mean, val mean value is of order comparable to that of the mean value of the absolute value of H. So The reason why we are comparing to the mean value of the absolute value of H is that in our error term for, for this condition, there is this absolute value of H coming up. To summarize these steps, we will be able to show that this stability condition holds if we can show that each of the, those, those twists of H by, by a character chi has a stable mean value whenever chi is such that th its mean value is of comparable order to the mean value of the absolute value of H. That might give a starting point for studying this final condition. And in particular, one can use it and in combination with the salbeck delange type argument to show that the following functions belong to our class H, to our class M, namely generalizations of the divisor function. So you take a k-fold convolution of the all one function. You may look at the function that counts representations by sums of two squares. You may consider the indicator function of the set of sums of two squares. And you may come up with similar functions that are related to zeta functions or L functions. For instance, you may look at the characteristic function of the set of numbers that are composed completely of primes that split completely in a fixed given finite Galois extension of Q. This is also a 
this is also a function that can be related to zeta functions and dedekind zeta functions. So this decomposition allows us to show that a couple of functions belong to our class M. And it might further be worth noting that for non-negative multiplicative functions, I just put absolute values in here to indicate that the function should be non-negative. One can prove the stability condition under the, the other conditions of the class so that if you have a non-negative function and want to prove that it satisfies the stability condition, one starting point might be to show that it is the trivial character that has the main contribution in this character expansion of the mean value in arithmetic progressions. I went too fast. So for a non-negative H, it would be enough to show that the main term in the expansion comes from the trivial character, or in other words, that the mean value of any twist with a non-trivial character is little o of the mean value of the absolute value of H. And one example of functions where this approach seems to work is functions that arise from taking the absolute value of the normalized Hecker eigenvalues of primitive holomorphic cusp forms, which are such that the Lin's bounds hold, and such that the Sato Tate conjecture is known. So in this case, the first three conditions will be satisfied. So the de Lin's bound will give us that the function is uniformly bounded along primes and satisfies this divisor function-like growth condition to show that the function is, has some stability along the sequence of primes. You may use the fact that at primes, the function is bounded in absolute value by two so that we can relate this absolute value of the function evaluated at P to the square by dividing by two. And then we may apply a result of Rankine in order to deduce the stability. Otherwise, one could use the Sato Tate measure directly. So the first three conditions can be established. The fourth condition takes a little bit more work. And in order to use an approach of this shape, one way one could proceed is to split this function again into essentially bounded parts and apply Halash's result in the form Grenville and Sandarajan gave and reduce matters to a consideration of a sequence essentially modulo one where, where you use a, a combination of this, this Sato Tate distribution the prime number theorem and arithmetic progressions and some consideration about the, the, the distribution of those dilates of log Pn modulo one. So now that we know that there are a couple of interesting functions in the class M, I want to move on and describe the statement of the main result. This is a little bit more complicated. To state this main result, we take R elements of the class of multiplicative functions I described. We take R linear forms, which are pairwise non-proportional, just as before. And now the statement says there exist two constants, B1 and B2, two positive constants and a function that assigns to any positive real number an integer w twiddle of x, which is fairly small. It will be bounded by log x to b1, where b1 is one of the constants, which is guaranteed. And 
Furthermore, it has the property that it is composed only of small primes. It is a product of powers of primes which run only up to log log x. And now the result says the following. This linear correlation of the functions, the, the functions from our class M, here it is normalized. If these functions HI composed with phi i plus a i were completely independent, then this correlation we would expect this co correlation to be roughly equal to the product of the mean values of the functions hi. Since these functions are not completely independent, we will have to change this a little bit. Instead of looking at average values, we will look at average values in arithmetic progressions. And in here, we are looking at an average value in an arithmetic progression modulo w twiddle at t, where t is this cutoff parameter. We are summing over all non-trivial residue classes ai, and the reason for which we can reduce here to looking at only non-trivial residue classes is that the functions are all multiplicative. So we have taken out the contribution of, of those factors which are composed of primes less than log log x into an outer factor. But the nice thing is that the sum over these, these wt smooth numbers can also be truncated. We only have to sum over r tuples of those integers composed of small primes for which the numbers run up to log t to the b2, where b2 is another constant that, come, that was guaranteed. So what we have here so far is a fairly short sum of mean values of our function in arithmetic progressions, of a product of these mean values of the function in arithmetic progressions. These products here have to be weighted with a count, a weighted count, of the number of solutions to a system of congruence conditions. And the system of congruence conditions counts how often the system of forms phi i plus a i takes the correct residue class, namely w i times a i, modulo the respective modulus, in this case, wi times w twiddle. So that's the correct count with what we have to weight this product of mean values and arithmetic progressions. This is the main term of our result. And there is some hope that if you understand these functions sufficiently well, for instance, if only the trivial character matters in this in this decomposition, then you should be able to simplify this expression quite a bit. But in the generality it is stated here, I don't see how it is possible. So that's the main term, and then the result has an error term, which is again fairly large. This error term is simply the product of the shear type upper bound for the absolute values of hi, but in this case, not in an arithmetic progression, but over the f taken over the full range. I will keep this full asymptotic formula and move it on to the next slide to make a bit more space. <laughs> and to, the reason for doing so is this error term shows that the, the asymptotic formula will only be non-trivial in the case where none of these functions hi has a lot of cancellation. So if we write sf of x to 
denote the mean value of the function f up to x, then this asymptotic formula here will be only non-trivial if the absolute value of the mean value of hi is of the same order of magnitude as this mean value of the absolute value of hi. One can say a little bit more about this condition. There has been recent work that was independently carried out by Elliot and Tenenbaum, who show that the condition under which our result produces non -trivial, a non-trivial statement is equivalent to saying that there is a real number t such that a certain sum over primes converges. And if that sum does not converge for any choice of t, then the condition here will not be valid. This sum over primes that appears, yes? Well, if, if, you, if you just take a trivial upper bound for each of these, these, um, you get the answer that without the zero, you get a big O. Okay, maybe it's non trivial then in that case too. I used some of the, <laughs> a lot of the input from that paper, so it's maybe not so surprising that you get out a result that. Okay, well, that is nice to know. Um, that will be less non trivial if this condition holds. And the, non -con the, the convergence of such a sum is closely related to the condition that appears in Granville and Sander or Jan's pretentious approach to analytic number theory. So it is worth mentioning that in recent work, Fancy Kinakis and Host studied a very similar problem to the one I'm looking at here. They look at, I'm sorry, I will go back one. They look at these kind of correlations but they are looking at functions hi that may be complex valued, but they have to be bounded. And in their case, they obtain non-trivial results, maybe in the same way non-trivial as the, in, 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 this, in this case, under the condition that for each of these functions hj, there be a real number tj and a character chi j, such that the sum of our primes here converges. And what has happened by going from up here to here is that we replaced this absolute value of our function at p by one. So we get a condition that now compares our function hj to the O1 function or a twist of it and no longer just to the absolute value of it. So there is maybe a bit more information that you can deduce from a condition where you compare with the one function, which is much easier to understand than this absolute value. But nevertheless, this is a result that is not, con not contained in in, in my result at all. So this is very different. And under the same setting of this pretentiousness condition, Kloman recently was able to analyze correlations of functions hi, but not along a system of linear for forms, but along a system of polynomials in one variable. So this much about the statement of the result. In the remaining time of this talk, I want to say a bit about 
the proof. The proof of the main result is based on the methods that Green and Tao developed in their work on primes. In particular, these methods allow you to produce asymptotic formula for this kind of linear correlations that I described in the beginning, but also appear in this main result. That is, you have a finite set of linear forms and at least two variables, set of constants and a set of arithmetic functions, and consider these linear correlations of the functions hi along the system of linear forms phi i plus ai. And you may obtain an asymptotic expansion with an unspecified error term, provided the functions h1 of 2 hr satisfy two conditions. And these two conditions are the following. First of all, it must be possible to construct a family of pseudorandom majorons for those functions h1 of 2 hr. I will say more about this first part in a bit. And then the second condition says that if you pick any of the functions hi, restrict this function to the first t integers and subtract off the mean value of it on the first t integers. This proce procedure ensures that you end up with a function that on the first t integers has mean value zero. And the condition, the, the, the assertion that has to be proved is that these functions are then orthogonal to near sequences, which is a generalization of saying that none of these functions hi can have a non-trivial large Fourier coefficient. I will focus on the first part of these two assertions that need to be need to be established. And to do so, I start by defining what a family of pseudorandom majorons actually is. So we say that a family indexed by, integer, by an integer parameter of functions that are defined for each parameter t on the first t integers and take values in the strictly positive numbers. Such a family will be a family of pseudorandom majorons for some function h if it is, first of all, a pointwise majorant. And it has to be a, point, a pointwise majorant up to some, some implicit constant, but this must be uniform in t. And the second condition says that this function should not be too far away from the function we start out with. From the first condition, we know that the mean value of our majorant is bounded below but by the mean value of the function we're interested in. But we also want to have that the, mean that the other direction of this comparison holds. So the measure and the function should have the same average order. And the final condition is one that models linear independence for a probability measure. It says that we have to be able to asymptotically evaluate correlations that are exactly of the shape as we want to evaluate for the functions hi, but with these functions hi replaced by this majorant. And if you normalize each function, each measure, by its mean value, then you will find that this correlation should evaluate to be roughly equal to 1. In order to start trying to look for such a majorant, you will have to have a strategy on how to produce these asymptotic formulae. So you are looking for a simple function for which you can asymptotically evaluate these correlations. And a shape of 
measurement function that proved to be very useful is that of a truncated divisor sum. This is the shape that appeared in the original work of Green and Tao, who used those Goldstone pentiodelian sieve weights, which are a divisor sum, and they are of a truncated type. K is, K is here not a character, but a cutoff function. So you are, in this case, this is a sum that runs roughly up to t to the gamma. By a truncated divisor function shape, I mean a function that is running over the divisors of d, uh, the divisors of m of the argument, but only up to some small power of the cutoff parameter. And this small power gamma should be it should be possible to choose it as small as we like. And each divisor will be weighted, will be weighted by some, will be counted by some weight. Why is such a shape so useful? So we, are, we have a truncated sum in here. And if we go back to the correlation that we have to evaluate, and if we insert a truncated sum into this expression, then we are in the position to swap the order of summation and take out the sum over divisors to the very to the very front. And this turns the whole correlation problem into one that counts lattice points in some region. So in this case it will count lattice points in a box actually, but but it's a slight simplification of what you actually have to do. So you will have to count lattice points in a region. And in the beginning, I, I said we are counting, we are counting, we are counting, we are summing over lattice points in some expanding region T times K, where K was sufficiently nice. And the condition of being sufficiently nice is necessary in order to obtain asymptotics from this lattice point counting argument. So you have to ensure that the boundary of this, uh, this region you are counting over is, is small enough compared to the volume in order to make this approach possible. Being able to choose gamma here as small as we like will ensure that we can choose the width of the lattice sufficiently small in order to also make this lattice point calc arg counting argument work. So this much about what kind of measurement we might be looking for. And for multiplicative functions, looking for a divisor function type measurement might not be completely hopeless. And you might be led to try to truncate this trivial expansion into a Dirichlet convolution of a multiplicative function. So this is a divisor sum coming from the O1 function in front. But if you try to truncate that, this is only going to give you something that has hope to be of the same order of magnitude as the function we start out with. If the convolution of our function with the Mobius function does not oscillate. So this convolution of H with the Mobius function should be non-negative. And under that condition, we were able to produce pseudorandom majorants in previous work with Browning. So in previous work with Browning, we looked at functions that I restrict here to non-negative functions. But in trying to produce a pseudorandom majorant or a majorant function, we are majorizing the absolute value of the function. So we can start out by a, by a non-negative function for the purpose of this discussion. And we were looking at functions with three conditions, the first two of which are contained in our definition of this class M. And the last condition says that the function should be non-decreasing along the set of prime powers for any fixed prime. This condition ensures that the convolution of the function h with Mobius is non-negative. But in particular, it says that 
if you set k equal to 1 in here, that the function takes values at primes of size at least 1. So now knowing that we have a non-negative convolution with the Möbius function, we may truncate this trivial expansion we have seen before just by summing only up to divisors up to some, some small power of t. And then we may hope but this is a major end for the multiplicative function we started out with. This is usually not quite the case. And one may analyze how badly that fails by introducing some sets, some bad sets, at any level kappa. So I introduce the set S of kappa to contain all integers m up to t, for which this condition here fails with implied constant given by h to the kappa. Now, look at this kappa. We may let this tend to infinity. As we increase kappa, the right-hand side here will increase. And for any fixed integer m, that we will be able to find some value of kappa so that m belongs to this bad set of level kappa, but will no longer be an element of the bad set at level kappa plus 1. And that observation can be used to artificially turn the starting point here into a measurement for the function we are looking at by summing over this left-hand side from here multiplied by h. So we are summing over h to the k kappa plus 1 times this truncated version of our function h times the indicator function of that set. So superficially, this now looks like a truncated divisor sum. It is unclear so far whether this sum converges. And another problem is that this set here, to, to decide whether or not an integer m belongs to this set, requires you to know, to have knowledge about all the divisors of m. So this characteristic function is not going to be of truncated divisor function shape. However, there is a structure theorem that is essentially due to Erdős that can be used in order to turn this, this superficial majorant into an actual one. And one ends up with a majorant function for elements of our class M under the extra condition that these elements should be non-decreasing along prime powers. So that is only a very small part of those functions that actually belong to our class M. In order to make use of this major and nonetheless, we will continue and decompose the multiplicative functions we are looking at. We decompose them into a product of two functions where one of the function is defined to be the at prime powers to be the maximum of the values that h takes on all the prime powers up to k. With that choice, we ensure that this function h sharp has the property that it is non-decreasing along prime powers. And then there will be a second function that just arises as the quotient of the the other two at prime powers, which is now by choice of the first function, a bounded function. So if we are able to find pseudorandom majorants for bounded functions, then we might end up with a pseudorandom majorant for a general function H from our class by just looking at the product of these two functions. It is not clear that the product of two pseudorandom majorants will actually produce something that is again a pseudorandom majorant. There is a lot of work to do, but there is at least some hope that this might work. 
So the main next task now is to find majorons for bounded multiplicative functions. And the starting point for this problem is a very, very basic observation. Namely, if you have an integer n that is composed into two co-prime factors, then the function will be bounded above by h evaluated at either of these factors. So can we turn this observation into a majorant? That is, can we perhaps assign to any integer that is bounded by t a specific divisor that is perhaps truncated and define a function by evaluating h at that specific divisor? So that's the plan. There is some care that we have to take. Namely, we will, will at various places in the argument in, in proving that a function is actually pseudorandom, things will be easier if you are, are able to swap the order of summation. So in order to swap the order of summation, it is necessary to be able to reconstruct from any given specific divisor the set of all integers for which this was the chosen divisor. So it's not possible to choose any truncated divisor of the function. We need to choose this with some we need to choose this in a systematic way. And here's one way how one can do that. Pick an integer n consider its prime factorization and order it by, the, by increasing prime factors. And now look at all the prime, look, look at all the divisors of n that are of the shape, the first j factors from this decomposition. Out of those factors, pick the first one that exceeds t to the gamma and although this is a little bit off from what we actually were aiming for, we will choose that as our specific divisor. It should be clear now that we can, can reconstruct the set of all integers from a divisor, namely, given such a specific divisor, the set of integers n less than or equal to t for which this was the specific divisor is the set of all integers for which the, the quotient of n by this divisor contains no prime factor that is smaller than the largest prime factor from here. And how are we going to turn this into a majorant? We are looking at a function where we first have a sum of our primes, so capital Q is a sum of our primes, up to t to the gamma, and this q will play the role of the largest prime from this chosen divisor. And there is a second sum over integers that are composed just of primes less than our chosen q, and the product q times m will play the role of this full sp specific divisor. This product is fairly small, it can be counted as a truncated divisor, so testing for divisibility of n by this product will be okay. Testing for whether or not this product is sufficiently large can be done by a cutoff function that should also be okay. And then we have to test that q times m is actually one of those special divisors for our integer n. In other words, in other words we have to check whether or not the quotient n divided by q times m has small prime factors. So that is something one has to think about a bit more, or maybe not so much. And then we evaluate h at q times m as, as, as we want it. So to deal with this, the visibility with this condition that there should be no small prime factors inside the quotient n divided by q times m. 
one can go back to those Goldstone pins, the adhering weights, and adapt them a little bit. We will have, okay, I will go back to all those slides to those. We will have, we will have, we have in these, these weights, we have a cutoff here at T to the gamma. This cutoff will essentially be exchanged for Q. And in the context of the major and we are looking at the divisor, the set of divisors will also be restricted in some sense. But you can use these weights, you will pick up some extra difficulties coming from the fact that that this log, log T was replaced by something that is a bit smaller, but they can all be handled with. So there is a way to turn this into a truncated divisor some major rund, and it remains to prove that this is actually pseudorandom. So these are the ideas for the first part of this program, and combined with the proof of the second part, one arrives at being able to asymptotically evaluate these linear correlations for multiplicative functions from this class M. I guess there's plenty of time left, but I will stop here. This condition, you mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, under that condition, is it possible to simplify this problem to the next one? Maybe. I'm not completely sure. So, I, I guess another way of phrasing the question is do you expect that if the, if the size of the linear correlation is at the same order as uh, the first of the two values, then you can somehow change that opinion? Well, if these, if the, if if you have if you have some idea about these mean values, if you can show that they all behave in a very similar manner, then of course you can take out this this whole term out of the the uh, out of the the product and and to the front of the sums, and the the expression will f will simplify quite a bit, and I think you can factorize it in that case into a product over prime. Hopefully. <laughs> Every epsilon is a delta, so it's like if you replace zero or one here with a delta, you can replace zero or in your main theorem by an epsilon. Yeah. Okay. While you're applying the inverse result, you should not be able to get any. Well, there's no effect this time, but I think you're computing at this, I think, um, at the quantitative level. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's yes, as long as you don't ask what the relation is between epsilon and delta. <laughs> <laughs> yes.
pas trop. Yes. I, I, I kept it in there. I mean, there, there is this new work which works without the correlation condition. But once you've proved the linear forms condition, you have all the tools available to establish the correlation condition. So there, there's not a lot of extra work to include it. So yes, that, that, that is in there as well. <coughs> 